recording the session. Um, and I'm just going to run through these poll questions that we had all of you filling out here real quick. So from where everyone's from, we have about 20% from the Northeast, 12% from the Southeast, 39% from the Midwest, 29% from the West. Uh, what type of organizations people are joining us from. We have 2% from federal DOT, 33% from state DOT, 21% from local DOT, 2% uh, from tribal government, uh, about 2% from LTAP, 12% from other federal, state, or local government agencies, 2% um, from first response agencies, 2% from educational institutions, and 12% private consultants, and 12% other. Um, most of you are joining us by yourself, um, but we do have, I know, a few groups uh, today uh, as well. So I think I've already messaged about how to get in touch with us to receive certificates if you'd like those after for the groups. And then it looks like we have people who, most of you, 96%, are joining us on the computer only. If you do have any audio issues today, you can let us know via the chat pod. But the best way to solve those would be to call into the phone number, and that is 866-749-7984. And that can be found in the top left-hand corner of your screen. I'm going to go ahead and move us over to our presentation now and just go through a few logistics for you. Our webinar today is an hour and a half long. Um, as with all of our webinars, this one is being recorded and will be archived on our website. For quality of that recording, we have muted everyone during the presentation. Um, I mentioned if you're listening on your phone, please mute your computer screens, otherwise you will hear some feedback. To maximize the presentation, in the top right-hand corner of your screen and on this slide right now, you'll see um, the little button that is a square with the four um, triangles outside of it. If you click on that, it will make your PowerPoint full screen and get rid of all the extraneous information. And that will be most helpful um, for any graphics or, um, or photos that you're trying to see bigger during today's presentation. At the end of each section, and today we'll be having three sections, there will be time for you to ask questions and answers. You can ask those questions by the chat pod, which is on the left-hand side of your screen. You can feel free to put those questions in there at any time. And when we do stop for question and answer, I'll read those out loud to our presenters. We also have a handout pod in the bottom uh, left-hand corner of the screen. And this has a PDF version of today's PowerPoint. And finally, we would ask if you wouldn't mind filling out our surveys afterwards. We do appreciate that um, to let us know what we can do to improve our webinars. Um, in addition, the, that first survey that will come out today directly following today's webinar will allow you to select if you'd like to re um, request a certificate of completion for today's webinar and the CEU form. Those typically come out about four to six weeks after the webinar will be emailed to you. Uh, the link for the survey, just in case it goes to your junk mail, can be found at the top of the screen right now. Um, again, it is also available in that PDF that you can download as well. Um, if you do request to receive the CEU, you will return those to continuing ed at montana.edu, which is indicated on the form, and not to the Rural Safety Center. It's a different uh, department at Montana State University that handles those. And if you'd like to see what CEUs you do have from any of the webinars that we've done or from any of our summits, you can also request a verification of completion form from continuing ed at montana.edu, and they will send you a list of all of those with a total number of CEUs you've received from Montana State. For today's presenters, we have three presenters joining us from Clackamas County today. We have first Joe Merrick. Joe is the Transportation Safety Program Manager for Clackamas County in Northwest Oregon, where he has lived and worked for 30 years. He oversees the Traffic Engineering Group, Drive to Zero Program, and the Motor Carrier Safety Program. Joe led the effort to create the county's first Transportation Safety Action Plan, which was adopted by the Board of County Commissioners in 2012. Clackamas County is the only county in Oregon with an adopted TSAP. The county's unique approach has been one that has recognized that traffic crashes affect all departments in the county, and a goal of zero fatalities cannot be achieved unless the goal is embraced by the entire organization. Next, we'll hear from Abe Mullen. Abe has served as a health and transportation impact planner for Clackamas County for two and a half years. 
He works with the Public Health Division and Department of Transportation and Development to incorporate a healthy and safe, health and safety in all policies approach into ongoing projects and processes. He graduated from Portland State University with a master's degree in public health and urban and regional planning. And last, we'll have Rob Sadowski join us. Rob is a transportation safety outreach coordinator for Clackamas County and has more than 30 years of government and nonprofit experience in housing, economic development, and alternative transportation. His work focuses on building a culture of safe driving in Clackamas County through marketing, outreach, and policy work. He has served as an executive director of the Street Trust in Portland, Oregon, the Active Transportation Alliance in Chicago, and the Chicago Mutual Housing Network. He conducts training and strategic planning workshops for emerging organizations. He is active in the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Council for the county and co-chairs its communications team. Rob serves as a board member of the Northeast Community Center, and I'm very excited uh, for today to hear what they have to present to all of us um, about the great work that they're doing in Clackamas County. Once you have completed this webinar, we hope that you will have an understanding of the safe road user element in the safe system approach and how it applies to rural areas. To achieve these webinar goals, you will learn to describe Clackamas County's road safety vision, to define the health and safety in all policies approach used by Clackamas County, and to identify Clackamas County's media campaign and social marketing principles to support safe system work. Now, before I turn this over to our guests today, um, I did just want to give a very, very brief uh, reminder of the safe system approach. Um, we did hear this in part one, but at this point in time, that's been a couple months ago, so I did just want to remind you um, that a safe system approach has been deployed internationally for over 30 years, and it has been extremely successful and shows drastic decreases in road-based fatalities when used um, in the countries internationally. And now it's something that we've begun using here in the United States. It focuses on improving all aspects of road safety and uses the two, the two main things of recognizing that humans or road users make mistakes and that road users are vulnerable, so we need to keep impacts to the body at tolerable levels. A safe system approach is made up of six principles, which um, we'll go into a little bit more detail, but you can see those around the outside of this circle. Um, and five elements, which you can see in the inside of the circle. And so today, we are talking about the safe road users portion of the five elements. The other four are safe vehicles, safe speeds, safe roads, and post-crash care. And in our six-part uh, webinar series, we will go through each one of these individually. This, for the six safe system principles, the first one is that death and serious injury is unacceptable, and this tells us that um, our priority really needs to be in saving lives. Um, we also know that humans make mistakes, and so this is something through using the safe system approach that we are um, beginning to make sure we are accommodating as we design um, our road system. We know that humans are vulnerable, so we need to make sure that we are accommodating the fact that if a human does get into a crash, we need to take into account that tolerable level um, and that's where we talk about some of these things, such as um, decreasing speeds so that it will be a, a, a tolerable level uh, if a crash occurs, or having clear zones as some of the other examples. We also speak about the fact that responsibility is shared. In the traditional approach that we've used, um, many times we lay blame on just the road user themselves. And at this point in time, we need to make sure that we know that it's not just the driver's responsibility. They do make mistakes, but there's also things that we, as engineers and planners, can also do to help um, make the road system more tolerable and safer. We also need to remember that safety is proactive. It's something that we can uh, look at risk factors and take care of some of these safety countermeasures ahead of time and not just be reactionary. And then we also need to remember that redundancy is crucial. Um, and later in today's presentation, you will see the Swiss cheese model and a little bit of uh, better explanation on redundancy being crucial. But that's where those five elements that we talked about come in. We want to make sure that we're considering safety from the five different aspects um, to form that redundancy. So again, safe road users, safe vehicles, safe speeds, safe roads, and post-crash care. And the last thing I'll leave you with before I turn it over to our speaker 
is um, just the understanding of the relationships between the, the concepts. So we talk a lot about traffic safety culture um, and forming that with the public and also within our own organizations and making sure that safety is a priority. That's really the foundation. The safe system approach is our framework for getting to um, where we want to be and our goal is zero, so the vision zero. So that's kind of how those three work together, um, safety culture, safe system approach, and zero. And to talk about this more in depth and to talk about uh, the safe road user aspect, I'm going to turn over the time now to Joe Merrick um, to give you the beginning of today's presentation. So Joe. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope all of you and your families are safe and well. Um, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, the journey that we've been on here in Clackamas County related to roadway safety with a particular focus on our safe road user. I want to preface um, this presentation by the county in terms of often as transportation engineers or transportation planners, we've found ourselves in this uh, unique position of trying to design roadways or plan roadways that are going to be safer for all users. But in inevitably, we all have this conversation about, well, gosh, if I can design or I can plan the road to be safe, but if my users aren't being safe, what do I do about that? And the old mantra for many of you that have been in the business for a long time is like, you can't cure stupid, but we've long since abandoned that. And at Clackamas County, I would often ask this question as did our Traffic Safety Commission, which is, what are we doing about the people? How are we working with the people? And, you know, my initial response is like, well, golly, I'm an engineer. I'm really not a people guy. I'm actually more of an introvert. So how, what do we do about this? And so... We've long been on a journey of trying to understand those relationships between what we do with our infrastructure and then how we reach out to the people, the users of the system, to keep them safe and to begin to think about what does safety culture mean for our roadway users and then now how is safety culture incorporated into this safe systems approach. And um, we've actually been doing this work in bits and pieces really start going back to 2005. So we've been at it for a while. And so as we look at our strategic priorities, the first element that we can look at when we're considering our safe road users is what does our organization have in place with respect to those policies or in our case strategic priorities. And with some of the background work we had done when these uh, strate strategic priorities were developed several years ago, we were able to bring this notion of transportation safety, safety culture into the conversation around the strategic priorities and help get that rolled into the overall county approach. And so this notion of ensure safe, healthy, and secure communities incorporate safety, as well as building a strong infrastructure speaks more to the, the infrastructure side. And you know, building public trust through good government even gets into our side of um, safety culture and reaching out to people and having people trust in the government, which I know is, can be hard these days, but beginning to think about um, our road users in the context of what is safe. And so these are our guiding principles that, that we use, and really we can boil these down to the notion of if we have safe roads, healthy people in a vibrant economy, we're doing pretty good, but one does not work well without the other. And really those three elements spill over into and encompass those broader strategic priorities. Oregon Department of Transportation in 2016 updated their Transportation Safety Action Plan with a goal to eliminate fatal and serious injury crashes by 2035. Um, echoing the work from the um, Toward Zero Deaths work that AASHTO did. And so that provides another element that, that we can rely upon that sets a higher statewide priority. And then additionally, we've worked with our public health department for a number of years 
and work to incorporate safety elements into our blueprint for a healthy Clackamas County, which is our um, community our community health improvement plan, and that has um, policies around eliminating all pedestrian, bicycle, and motor vehicle crashes in Clackamas County. And so, as you'll see, we have also tried to thread safety throughout the organization in a variety of different ways. When we updated our safety action plan in 2018 from our 2012 plan, we also followed the Oregon DOT recommendation and the uh, towards zero deaths of eliminating fatal and serious injury crashes by 2035. We know that's a very um, uh, it's a very lofty goal, but again, we always ask the question is what is the number? And it's like, well, zero is the number, so that's really what we need to work towards. And as we look at the components of our safety action plan, it follows very closely the towards zero deaths work, and this has also been reflected in the road to zero work. Um, the National Safety Council is working on of looking at our crash data trends, our safe drivers and passengers, which we're talking about today, safe infrastructure, safe vehicles, safe vulnerable users, enhanced emergency medical services, safety culture, and safety management. So we've tried to be inclusive of all the elements. And what's particularly interesting to me is we find ourselves on the transportation side of the house being the champions for things that in some regards will be outside our normal wheelhouse. And that is, you know, dealing with the people part of this. But it's still so important um, and it needs a champion. As we look at our crash data, like many agencies, um, we've seen increases in our fatalities, unfortunately. And particularly, if we look during the pandemic, most of you have seen or read reports about increases in fatalities, considering the drops in traffic volume during the, the uh, most acute part of the, the pandemic last year. Also, our populations are increasing as more people move into the county. And so clearly we have a lot of work to do as we strive to get to zero. Um, one of the things we look at is the, the, cra the cost of crashes. And sometimes that is overlooked, but depending on your audience, that's going to be another uh, important element to bring up because these these are, are costly to the community, they're costly to the agency, they're, they're costly to the to the public. Many of us, as we look at our own data, we can look at these most common contributing factors in our reported crashes. And for our county, um, what we see is a high percentage of inexperienced drivers involved in crashes. So those typically under 25 with not a lot of driving under their belts are really they're still learning. Roadway departure crashes, particularly in our rural areas. Um, and then the next component of that is what happens when that person leaves the road. Are they going into a deep ditch? Are they hitting a fixed object, such as a utility pole or tree? And what can we do about that? Aggressive driving, which we've seen a lot of during the pandemic. Um, people speeding, people driving too fast for conditions. And then, uh, like many agencies, we have overrepresented motorcycle fatalities. Um, Oregon does have a helmet law. Um, so these are crashes involving motorcycle operators and passengers, and then alcohol, drug use, um, also in Oregon, marijuana is illegal, so we're seeing an increase in marijuana combined with other drugs or alcohol. Our senior drivers, um, and then last but certainly not least, our pedestrians and bicycle operators. So as we look at those contributing factors that helps uh, inform us in terms of things that we need to do, as we think about our safe systems approach, we're thinking about all these elements that are put together of our systems either uh, create redundancy to prevent a crash or they fail. And, um, you know, good examples that, that I can think of, you know, we have our safe road users, so if we can instill good values and safety culture into those people uh, uh, driving or operating a bicycle, that they're you know wearing a bicycle helmet, they're buckled in the car, 
um, they're properly oriented to the things in the vehicle, et cetera. And then if we have safer vehicles, when we look at airbag technology, how that has really increased the survivability of very severe, severe crashes. We control speed zoning on our roads, and so we can try to set speeds and be supported by law enforcement um, to enforce those speeds. And then the work that we do on keeping our roads safe, you know, guardrails in the corners, proper signing. And so if we have all those systems that work, we can see a reduction in crashes. And, and arguably, in my mind, you know, the safe road user part is some of the hardest part because we're dealing with human behavior. And as engineers, I mean, it's really not our expertise. And so we try to do things um, which may or may not be successful because, again, it's not our expertise. And so the importance of being able to bring in the people that know about that information, which is why I'm so excited to have a Molin with us to talk about um, our health and safety work and Rob Sadowski, who has spent years working with people on doing outreach. And certainly, they both bring expertise that I certainly don't have. I can design a road and make awesome guardrail, but in terms of how how to convince a person that you know they want to uh, put their cell phone in do not disturb mode, definitely not my expertise. So when we look at our building blocks, you know, obviously all of us want to understand what's happening with crashes in our in our uh, our organization, our county, our city, our our DOT, and then that recognition and inclusion of public health in the work that we do. And again, because public health often, they're often dealing with people. They're often doing outreach around various public health related matters. And so they bring both an incredible level of precision and data to the table, as well as knowing how to talk to people. Um, our staff management elected officials, it's important that they recognize the importance of safety and really support that. And as an example, um, you know, we're in front of our Board of County Commissioners enough that they know we have a safety action plan, they know we have a goal to eliminate fatal and serious injury crashes, and there were times when we didn't, safety didn't pop up on their radar, and so it only popped up on their radar when a constituent would call and complain about a safety issue. And so we've been able to elevate safety within the organization to something that is important up through the organization. So from uh, my engineers right on up through our managers and Board of County Commissioners. And then, as all of you know, it's important to have our community support of both, both safety and public health goals. And then we always want to try to intertwine safety and public health policies across the organization because, A, Somebody in public health is doing outreach around a particular matter, and they are versed in some of the safety issues and vice versa, where I can talk about some public health matters. We all then have a broader span of reach within our audience, and then we're more effective that way. And then, obviously, too, we, we have funding. We need to have money to do our work. So we need to be able to fund that infrastructure work, build those road improvements. We need to be able to do and fund the outreach, which you'll hear more about that from uh, Rob in terms of, of campaigns. And then those public health elements that Abe will be talking about are really important, which also take money. If we're going to do a health impact assessment as part of a project, we need funding to do that. And so really we need to invest and be convincing in terms of our discussions with management and in our budgetary processes of the importance of investing in safety and safety-related public health and these non-infrastructure things, which sometimes can be hard to pin the benefit-to-cost ratio to. So with that, um, that concludes my part. And I think we, uh, let's see, are we at a poll question? We are. Thank you very much. So before we go to the poll, I just want to remind everyone that if you do have any questions for Joe, you can put those over on the left-hand side in the chat box. Um, and at the same time, I am going to move us over to a poll question where we have a question for all of you. So on the left-hand side, this one is, which of the following are in the Clackamas County Safety Vision? 
a three-pronged priority of safe roads, healthy people, and vibrant economy to eliminate all pedestrian, bicycle, motor vehicle traffic crashes in Clackamas County, to eliminate fatal and serious injury crashes by 2035, to intertwine safety and public health policies across the organizational structure, to incorporate the safe system approach, all of the above or none of the above. And then for those of you who have um, previously joined us for a webinar, this will sound very familiar to you, but for each section, I'm gonna ask you this today. Um, what is one action item that you'd consider implementing in your own jur jurisdiction based on what you've heard um, already during today's presentation? So you can just jot those down for yourself at your desk. Um, if you're willing to share, we'd love to see those in the poll pod as well, um, just to give us some ideas of what, you know, what you're thinking could work for, for your jurisdiction. And we'll give everyone just a few seconds to fill out these poll questions, and then I will um, post the results for everyone to see, and Joe will go ahead and respond to them. So just a couple more minutes. Okay, it does look like most people have finished the first poll, so I've ended that, and Joe, this time you should see those results if you'd like to address that one. Um, it does look like from the poll results that about 3% picked A, and A is correct. However, all of these are correct. Um, and so the correct answer is all of the above. Clackamas County is using every single one of these as part of their safety vision. And it looks like from the challenge question, um, some of the answering answers that we got was to take a more detailed look at crash reports to determine actual causes of crashes rather than just the statistics. Um, to advertise that traffic safety is a public health issue. That's fantastic. We heard that one um, specifically at our very first summit when we had a Center for Disease Control come and speak as well. Um, some other examples were safe, vulnerable users to work more with the health department, to ask the public what makes each of these 1,500 plus fatalities acceptable, um, and, and quite a few more here. So thank you everyone for taking the time to, um, to fill those out. It does not look like at this time that we have any questions for Joe. So I am gonna go back over to our presentation and line us up for our next speaker. All right, and next we're gonna have uh, Abe Mullen. Abe? Thanks, Jamie, can you, can you hear me okay? Yep, can hear you perfect. And okay. then the arrow keys right below will um, help you move the slides. Okay, great. Thanks, Jamie. Hello, everybody. My name is Abe Moland. I'm the Health and Transportation Impact Planner with the Clackamas County Public Health Division, and I'm here to talk a little bit about the work happening in the division to support safe road users in the county. Um, thanks, Joe, for that great introduction and overview to, to the, the work. I'll start with a quick primer on um, what it is that public health departments do and who we are, and then move to talk some more about our health and safety and all policies approach that we use in the county. Uh, so public health divisions and departments protect community well-being by using data to track, quickly respond to, and prevent things like outbreaks of infectious disease, which is very top of mind these days, ensure food and water safety, uh, advance early childhood immunization, provide vital statistics records like death and birth certificates, and manage and address the root causes of chronic illnesses like diabetes, asthma, and heart disease. Uh, health departments are look to, to use their unique assets, skills, and competencies to form partnerships with other sectors to reduce the incidence and high costs associated with these preventable chronic diseases. So the color wheel on the right shows the 10 essential functions that all public health departments perform. They fall within three broad categories, uh, assessing community health and understanding the, broad, the root causes of injury and disease, developing policy to improve public health and assure quality delivery, of means to improve health. And so these functions are kind of the puzzle pieces that uh, public health partners bring to the table of intersector partnerships to add a health lens to programs and projects. So there's lots of models that guide public health work. The Clackamas County Public Health Division leverages the health impact pyramid frequently, and it's a tool that we use to orient our County Board of Health to where our public health work and interventions are focused on. 
And it's a tool that was developed in response to the traditional public health approach of looking at um, healthcare interventions and individual level response to really take into account how our uh, in individual and, and community and group conditions influence health and opportunities to health. So the foundation of the pyramid represents socioeconomic factors like education and income, which we know have a direct correlation with uh, health and well-being. And then the next tier up focuses on changing the context to encourage healthy decisions. So a defining feature of this is people would have to expend significant energy to not benefit from them. So something like fluoridizing water or uh, putting a signal at an intersection where there are long wait times and people make risky moves to pass through. The next tier up focuses on one-time long-term interventions to improve health, like childhood immunizations or smoking cessation. And then the top two tiers focus on clinical interventions, individualized counseling, and education programs. So the framework overall suggests that interventions in the two base tiers of the pyramid provide the greatest overall potential to improve health, but can require societal change that often lacks political will. And interventions towards the top of the pyramid focus on individual level interventions that may not be as effective, but can be cheaper up front and possibly less controversial. We've covered this a little bit already. I'll just run through this quickly. Um, but these are some of the principles already talked about around the safe systems approach, that people will make mistakes that lead to crashes. The human body has a limit to tolerating crashes. Road safety is everybody's responsibility, especially those who design the roads and use them. And the elements of the road system must be strengthened to, prov uh, to provide multiple, multiplicative protective efforts. And to think these two concepts together, uh, the state systems approach merges very nicely with the health impact pyramid, where there are elements of those principles sprinkled throughout the entire individual and societal um, intervention spectrum. And I want to highlight that I think that the, the responsibility uh, for road safety, safety crosses all of the health impact pyramid uh, components. So there's elements of that in education and direct health care service, health promoting interventions, making healthy choices the easy choices, and then the environmental components. And we can't talk about public health without talking about health equity, some of the biggest barriers to building the society where everyone is able to attain a, a level of complete mental, physical, and social well-being are the barriers that folks face based on their social or economic class, race, ethnicity, religion, age, gender, sexual identity, or any other social condition. Uh, so the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation defines health equity as the uh, everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. So thinking about health equity in the context of safe road users meet, uh, can mean that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to travel as safely as possible. Uh, and when we don't think about barriers that people face based on social identities when we're planning interventions to promote road safety, uh, we create solutions that might not work for everyone and can create further inequities and disparities. Uh, so this is why public health leads with an equity lens and engages the root and overlapping causes of poor health, like racism, structural disadvantage, and differential privilege. And efforts grounded in health equity focus overall on the forest and not the tree. They fix the context and conditions that support access, health, and well-being. And they, they don't necessarily focus on the actions of one individual person, more so the barriers that they may face in attaining, attaining health and well-being. So recently, within the past two years, the county has created an office of equity to advance equity initiatives for both our internal work and our external county work. And they advocate the use and awareness of the targeted universalism framework, which I think operationalizes an approach that's grounded in, in equity quite nicely. And this approach is one that makes transformative and structural changes based on the gaps that exist between groups and universally shared goals, like eliminating uh, uh, serious uh, injury and fatal crashes, and sheds light on the barriers presenting reaching those goals. Uh, so a high-level overview, five steps to, to a targeted universalism approach is establish a universal goal based on a broadly shared societal problem, assess general population performance relative to the universal goal, identify groups and places that are performing differently with respect to that goal, assess and understand the structures that support or impede each group or community from achieving the universal goal, and then developing and implementing targeted policies, systems, and environmental changes for each group to reach the universal goal. 
So in that last piece too, I think it's important to highlight that we're focusing on that policy systems and environmental change component and not necessarily the individualistic behavior element. So we're uh, creating systems that support everybody by focusing on the, the needs of the folks that face the greatest barriers. Uh, implementation strategies will vary in form and content as well as the kinds of resources that are required. So this approach encourages building structures uh, that make sure everyone has access to the same means and opportunities. And uh, this slide from the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative Inc. highlights opportunities to assess and understand those structures that support or impede each group or community from achieving the universal goal. Um, the boxes on the left highlight social inequities, institutional inequities, and living conditions. And these are what the public health goal references as upstream elements or social determinants of health or conditions that we know influence someone's health and well-being. And they provide pathways to develop and implement the targeted policy systems and environmental changes for each group to reach universal goals that focuses on outcomes like the risk behaviors, disease and injuries, and mortality outcomes that are along the right side of the, the spectrum there. Um, to create conditions that support safe road users, the public health approach will focus on the conditions that create the disparities in, in outcomes in order to improve those outcomes. So a few more things to highlight on this slide. The round blue uh, boxes along the middle of this slide are areas that overlap with the competencies from the 10 essential public health functions that we reviewed earlier, things like strategic partnerships and advocacy. And then that uh, blue bar along the bottom uh, references what is traditional public health practice focusing on uh, risk behaviors, disease and injury and mortality. And um, what is emerging practice on the left to focus on the skills and abilities to engage in upstream conditions that influence health. Uh, so one tool that we'll talk about now is the health and all policies movement and how we were advancing that within Clackamas County. So what is health and all policies? It is a collaborative approach that integrates and articulates health considerations into policy making across sectors. Uh, the goal is to ensure that decision makers are informed about the health and equity implications or consequences of options during policy development. Um, it can involve things like a task force or student group that brings together representatives of different sectors to dis discuss policy changes and focus on social, physical, and economic influences on health to address inequities in health outcomes. So in Clackamas County, uh, because of the really strong partnership between the Department of Transportation and Development and the Public Health Division, we frame this as uh, health and safety and all policies that elevate the concept of safety in all decision-making spaces. And in 2015, staff uh, between our two departments collaborated to review policy decisions made by our board of county commissioners in the previous year. And the aim of this evaluation work was to find ways to strengthen local policies adopted by the board. And of the 527 decisions reviewed, almost 80% had some connection to health or safety outcomes. And so this is an important process outcome from this work with the adaptation of uh, the health and all policy framework to include safety and become health and safety and all policies. And it uh, provides the new terminology and an ongoing shared policy lens between our departments uh, to advance safety work in the, the county. So, uh, Health and all policies overall is still an emerging field, and there isn't one playbook necessarily to implement it across different contexts and jurisdictions and, and geographies and spaces. So um, something that I often reference is an article that came out of the Journal of Public Health Management that operationalizes uh, health and safety and all policies into a couple, uh, seven, seven action areas that we'll walk through. So uh, to start with, and I think this is one of the more foundational ones, is uh, sorry, I'm going to minimize something on my screen. Okay, great. Uh, is developing cross-sector relationships and getting to know people outside of your discipline. And there are some formal ways to do this uh, through interdisciplinary working groups and committees. Um, and I think the informal relationship building uh, process to this is really important too in developing meaningful, authentic relationships with people across sectors uh, because trust-based relationships with partners uh, create opportunities to engage in honest and transparent ways that build momentum and support innovative intervention development. Um, so a couple of examples of this in the county, Joe already touched on our community health improvement uh, plan where we coordinate work groups with community-based organizations and other county partners. 
uh, to update our community health improvement plan to improve uh, health outcomes. And then uh, another example is the Department of Transportation and Development and our Public Health Division have developed a memorandum of understanding for consultation services with our division epidemiologist. And then we also um, are working to increase awareness of cross-sector activities with various county committees, so including this includes the Public Health Advisory Committee, the Traffic Safety Commission, and the Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Committee. Uh, so Next action area, incorporating health into the decision-making process. This is focused on creating tangible tools and steps to incorporate health and safety into decision-making processes like checklists or health impact assessments. A couple of examples of this, the county received funding to implement complete streets improvements in an unincorporated area of the county, and we're conducting a health impact assessment to understand the health benefits, um, understand what are other conditions beyond the road that promote safe road users, and support the long-term monitoring of health outcomes um, from the road improvements once the project is complete. Uh, we also received funding to conduct a long-range visioning process for a corridor in the county, and we scoped a health assessment um, into that visioning process to understand the health and well-being connections to the economic uh, and land use and transportation assessments that are happening in, the, in that area. Uh, the next action area, coordinating funding, uh, looking for funding opportunities through an interdisciplinary lens and bringing in staff from multiple departments to understand shared benefits and opportunities to achieve mutual goals. An example of this is we partnered uh, together to write a grant for funding to update the bicycle and pedestrian plan for unincorporated and rural Clackamas County, and through that approach, we're able to scope a health and equity framework into the plan update to help guide decision making around project and policy prioritization. And then the final action area on this slide is enhancing workforce ca capacity, uh, building staff ability to connect health and equity concepts to their own work, whether it's a process they're facilitating or a project or policy they're working on. And this can be done through training, continual education, uh, conferences, and then specific targeted hiring practices. So bringing on uh, non-traditional staff and, and departments or, or split staff and that's an example of, of my role of the Health and Transportation Impact Planner, uh, which is a position that's funded both by the Public Health Division and the Department of Transportation and Development. And the scope is specifically to look at a, at a wide range of um, activities happening in, in the county and apply a health impact assessment and health and safety and policy lens to those to identify areas to um, incorporate a health and equity lens. So it, supports the uh, Public Health Division in achieving community health improvement goals and the Transportation uh, Department in incorporating health and equity goals and, uh, and adds, adds a lot of bandwidth to uh, focus on time on building relationships and advancing that work. And then our final action areas, uh, data and evaluation. So this is folding in public health data and best practices uh, into work that's happening and establishing health performance metrics. Uh, for me in the county, a way that I, I think is, has been most effective in operationalizing this is through the participation in project-specific advisory committees, which provides a space to develop deeper relationships and understand the context that's happening around a project and how to best bring in health and equity perspectives and voices. And uh, so if you're putting together an advisory committee, I highly recommend reaching out to your local public health department to recruit somebody to bring that public health perspective. Um, implementing accountability structures, so focusing on developing shared goals and objectives, and Joe has already talked a lot about this in our work around identifying shared goals um, in our county documents and, and plans and programs. And then uh, thinking messaging, which is where I begin to hand off the work to uh, Rob, that he has much more expertise uh, uh, to talk about this than I do. Um, so, uh, yeah, o overview, that, that's the seven health and safety policy areas that the Public Health Division is working on to advance uh, conditions and vacant system change efforts uh, across the county to support the health and safety of, of road safety users. With that, I think we have another question. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Abe.
Um, so one more time, I'll remind everyone that any questions you might have, you can put those in the chat pod over on the left-hand side, and I'll read them out to Abe just here in a second. Um, but while we are waiting to see if we have questions, we have two questions again for you. So the very first one is a true-false question. Um, true or false, health and safety in all policies is a collaborative approach to integrating health and safety into all decision-making processes that focuses on social, physical, and economic influences on health to address inequities and in health outcomes. And then again, um, that challenge question from this section of the webinar talking about um, public health and how you can incorporate that into transportation. Is there anything that you'd consider implementing in your jurisdiction? Again, you can write those down at your desk as an action item. And if you're willing to share those with us, we'd love to see those in the chat pod as well. And I'll give everyone just a, a few seconds here to fill those out and then broadcast the results. And again, any questions go, can go on the left-hand side in that chat pod. All right, and Abe, at this time, it looks like um, everyone who's going to respond to the first true-false question has done so, so I broadcast those results. If you'd like to go ahead and address that, please. Yeah, it looks like we have, for those that answered, a 100% uh, rate. Everybody answered it correctly. That is true. That is an accurate description of our health and safety health policies approach. And the fact that it is a collaborative approach to incorporate health and safety into all decision-making processes. Perfect. Thank you. And then for everyone who's filling in the um, challenge question, uh, some of the examples are to contact the Injury Prevention Office of a public health district in the state to find out what they're doing regarding traffic and occupant pedestrian bike safety, and connect with the Office of Highway Safety Task Team, um, incorporating public health policies into road safety analysis and training, and talking to the local public health organizations to see what they're doing to support safety. All fantastic ideas. Um, and if we do actually have one question for you. Um, it says that it would be most helpful if you could give a quick but specific example of following the HSIAP um, process. Is that something you'd be able to do? Can they, can they define HIP for me, the specific uh, model or, or process that they're looking for? I assume they mean the health and safety and all policies process um, that you were alluding to. Okay. I see Susan typing. I did. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I guess I would use the example that's a good example. I mean, there's, there's so many to pick from, and I think I, I would want to underscore that they can be as small and seemingly easy as possible and as difficult and comprehensive as, as you want. I would, I would classify looking up your local public health department and reaching out and starting a conversation as, as a health and safety and a policy tactic. I, I think that um, that's a really easy way to start the conversation and um, start the ball rolling on these um, other action areas and, and start to identify opportunities to collaborate and find the shared ground where you have um, goals that you both want to work on together. Um, so that's a really easy way. I think something that takes more planning and, and funding and resource and staff time is something like a health impact assessment um, to incorporate into the decision-making process around a, a road project. So I would reference, again, the uh, Courtney Avenue uh, Complete Streets Improvement that we're working on to understand what are some of the challenges to walking and biking in an area beyond the, the road um, environment and develop recommendations to the decision makers for that project to um, complement those road improvements to make it safer for folks to bike and walk and more encouraging. And, um, and then kind of lay the groundwork to identify future funding to advance walking and biking in the, in the area for, for everyone. So hopefully that starts to get at, at some specific examples soon, definitely. And, and please reach out if, um, if you have any follow-up questions after that, if you in the conversation offline. And this, this is Joe. Am I unmuted? Mm -hmm. You are. Yep. 
So I could kind of add to that. So the, the, the example that Abe gave around the Courtney Avenue is a good example of, of essentially implementing a health and safety in all policies because with that project, we've expanded that project from being just a, uh, I mean, it's a pedestrian bike improvement project, but we have are incorporating this, this stronger health and safety element into the project process prior to design. And so that's an example of, of implementing it. And in, in essence, what Abe and I have talked about quite a bit is uh, at what, what point in a process you can incorporate the health and safety elements and, you know, maybe in a planning process, it may be in an engineering process. But again, just being able to um, incorporate that health and safety through these tools such as a health impact assessment. Hopefully that helps clarify it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Joe. Um, and we do have one more question for you, Abe, and that is, um, do you have a more complete definition of the difference between equity and equality in terms of safety issues? Yeah, I would, I would define that in, I guess I would start with the two very different terms, and I would lay the context when you're planning a road intervention or safety intervention, uh, a, an intervention that's grounded in equality will apply the same tactics across all population groups, regardless of the differences that exist within them. And a uh, safety intervention that's grounded in equity will take some time to identify, understand, and then address the unique circumstances that different road users face based on different identities. So that goes beyond mode, um, but it starts looking at historic uh, differences between groups and some of the specific contexts and actions that have happened to groups. And, and this goes beyond uh, looking at things that have happened at the macro level in the country, but understanding specific context with the, uh, in, at the local level of what's happened in a community or to a specific group. And so taking the time to develop relationships that understand those and, and see the people that are most affected and face the, the greatest barriers, hear them, incorporate them into the process, and uh, design solutions that meet their needs uh, to uh, help them achieve uh, the, the shared universal goals around safety. And I'll go through a little bit more of that, and we probably will have time at the end if we want to dive more deeply into the work that we're doing around equity, diversity, and inclusion as it relates to our transportation uh, work. Perfect. Thank you, Rob. And with that, Rob, we are all set uh, for your section as well, so you can go ahead. And there are arrow keys underneath the PowerPoint that you can click through. Um, and when you're ready yep. to try the video, just let us know, and we'll keep that up for you. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everybody. We're kind of like now at the tail end of the presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple things. I'm going to talk essentially about how we take um, uh, how we design messaging and uh, approach behavioral change uh, and take some of the things that we've just been talking about, whether it's the health and safety uh, and all policies approach or the, just sort of the ecological viewpoint uh, of social ecology into designing campaigns to target folks, uh, but also how we think about uh, designing selection of campaigns of relates to equity. So we've got lots, to, lots of opportunities to talk about things. So one of the things that I'm going to just sort of lay out is that um, we, when we look at trying to change safe road users' behavior, um, start out with the feeling that it's really hard to do. We know it's hard to do. Uh, we know it's particularly hard to change uh, adults and older adults in their behavior. Uh, so we typically tend to focus our work on young adults and new drivers uh, because there's a greater chance to impact uh, that over time. But we also are in a state that doesn't require driver's education uh, as a uh, requirement for high school graduation. And so we have some limits on how we can deliver that information. Uh, so here's some of the sort of principles behind our work. We understand that traffic safety is a public health matter, uh, that it is one of the leading causes of serious injuries and fatalities, particularly among our young adults. Uh, it was just passed, super suicide just passed 
uh, uh, traffic fatalities in our state for the first time, uh, but they've been running neck and neck for several years. Uh, secondly, we establish overall community norms that reinforce safe driving and traffic safety. So even if the work that we do to do campaigns isn't really necessarily changing behavior, we do have the opportunity as a community, as a county, to establish what we believe are community norms, such as don't drive while texting or don't drive while using marijuana. But those are things that we want to make sure that we're out in front about and that we want to reinforce that with community leaders, community partners, et cetera. Uh, we want to clearly anchor the county is caring deeply about traffic safety. So some of this is optics, some of this is just making sure that, uh, you know, that we're covering all the bases, uh, but we're also understanding that the county, uh, county more so than cities, uh, are the places where care and mental health care and medical care uh, is distributed and uh, and that sense of caring uh, should be deeply should deeply inform traffic safety and the understanding of trauma should inform traffic safety. Uh, to do all that, we need to understand the people and the data. Uh, we understand understand where people come from by doing focus groups, by having uh, research uh, to make sure that we understand the difference between, say, a teenage girl in a rural community versus a suburban boy. Uh, who skateboards. Those are two different people with two different targets and two different uh, ways to, to communicate, and so we have to understand that all in order to get this work done. We know we can't do it alone, so we do a lot of work building community collaborations, and we've learned a lot in the last two years, particularly with our work around COVID and wildfires, on how better to build community collaborations, particularly communities that have not traditionally been engaged in our county governance. Um, uh, we direct education as much as we can so that we're not taking out a single billboard or a single campaign focused on everybody at once. We try to focus where we can uh, to make that difference. Uh, sometimes we have a very focused campaign that we go wider knowing that it has an opportunity to go wider but that it's written and designed uh, for a specific target in mind. And through that type highly targeted focused campaign, we can then learn some uh, really interesting results as well as getting data feedback back. Uh, beyond sort of the data side or the fact that traffic crashes uh, are, are clearly a, reach an academic level, traffic crashes are sort of a public health issue that affects people in very different ways. And when we talk and we go out to communities or when I'm making a presentation in school about a traffic um, uh, safety concern such as driving while drunk, um, our communities are often facing this in a very deeply rooted personal level. Um, everybody knows about, you know, that high school kid who was, um, you know, driving that car two weeks ago, got into a crash and died. Or we know that there are elements of stories that really tie uh, uh, longer stories together. So I'm actually going to talk a little bit about the picture on the bottom left, which was uh, a case where a uh, automated, semi-automated vehicle, uh, a Tesla, uh, was being operated by a professional golf pro um, who drank uh, at lunch at the club that they worked for to a point where they had a 0.17 blood alcohol level, had three uh, other um, um, passengers in their car, uh, was in an area where it was a uh, rural lane that had some very difficult components to it that may have uh, conflicted with the lane detection software that the Tesla had. Anyway, this vehicle ended up in a pond uh, on a stump saving their lives. But we talk about that because there's so many different ways to think about the opportunities that we could uh, invest and inject uh, uh, change uh, for everything from uh, thinking about our, our roadway, you know, the, the safe system approach on the roadway is making sure that we have um, fog lines or edge lines on both sides so that that lighting detection software can work better. But thinking about what happened? Why were those servers serving this person? Was this a problem with this uh, um, individual before? And did their workplace know of problems with them drinking and driving in the past? Are there ways that we can retrain those, those staff who are servers or retrain the valet who handed the keys over? What are those opportunities for me as someone working on this to engage the community on issues that can make meaningful change over time? Uh, 
Abe showed uh, a series of different ways that we think about this work in terms of a social ecology model. Uh, we very much believe at uh, the Department of Transportation in the model presented by the Center for Health and Safety, which is Montana State University's uh, model uh, that uh, called the Positive Cultural Framework that really frames that if you're going to get to an individual and change their behavior, you need to understand where they fit within family and peers, schools and workplace, community, et cetera, and to be able to implement strategies to really understand what ways that we can um, increase protective behaviors, decrease risky behaviors across that social ecological model, but also understand that the old way of communicating around driving safely, the ticket or click it model per se, or the don't drive drunk or you will die model is getting harder and harder to reach, particularly high school kids, because they're bombarded with negative messages, they're bombarded with gore and blood in their video gaming, et cetera, and it's harder and harder to reach and change behavior through that. And so this behavioral model looks at changing uh, more from a more uh, 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 understanding of what the culture of that person comes from, understanding cultural norms and approaching, uh, making sure that we can approach through that process. And that's our work and that's how we get in, inform our work. Uh, this is just kind of a little uh, fun little map that we developed as part of our traffic safety action plan that helps inform that is that, you know, any person along this, along this community um, uh, can be impacted by so many different partners, whether it's counselors at school or uh, driver's education teachers when they have them, or through social media, friends and partners and parents and block clubs and neighborhood associations, church groups, and et cetera, that we're all connected within this work. And my way of thinking about this is that if I can find a new partner, uh, there may be a really interesting new opportunity uh, to really engage with that group. For example, we're struggling and we know the entire state has been struggling with motorcycle safety, what if we started working with motorcycle salespeople to try to help um, um, really direct some of that education uh, in, in, in an interesting way and get them on our side, but also help tap into their goals of uh, being seen as a uh, partner with uh, safety as part of their own mission. I mentioned earlier that you know this past year, as everyone knows, has been a tough year. A lot of, uh, uh, of, of my work had really changed. I was doing a lot of work in schools and doing community fairs, and, and a lot of that changed. In fact, I got pulled over to do some work around COVID and wildfire safety. But one of the things that was really interesting is that we began having conversations about our approach uh, that really had some mutual benefit. Uh, we began to talk, I began to talk to our public governance affairs who are not behavioral change specialists, but they're really good at putting social media out there about the importance of understanding care, the importance of understanding um, uh, culture and framework, and that I started to help change the way they communicated around uh, COVID and vice versa. So I just kind of share some of the, uh, the kind of fun, warm messages um, regardless of what we're talking about, for example, here we're talking about wildfire, always showing that masks are going to be worn by our volunteers or by our staff to make sure that it's also part of the cultural norming um, and really showcasing uh, the different people that are engaged within the framework, within their, you know, the physical presence of where they are within their communities and not using stock photos, for example. And here you'll see, you know, one of the things that we learned pretty clearly is People are motivated not necessarily for their own self-good, uh, uh, unless there's a clear benefit to them, but they're more, they are more motivated to wear their mask for their family. So here's a, a woman she's holding a sign that I wear my mask for my grandparents, and that was based on focus grouping and understanding um, that, that's, uh, that that's an important piece. And so if, well, one of the things that we learned from that in traffic safety is that maybe our messages are around not about don't drive without a, don't, you know, if you drive without a seatbelt, you'll get a ticket, but really making sure that all your passengers are wearing a seatbelt because of how important that is for safety, or your family needs you to get home, or in some cases, we don't have an ICU bed for you right now, and now's not the time to get into a crash. One of the things that's nice about working for uh, Clackamas County or any kind of small county is that we have a lot of resources that we can cover and wrap and 
help in terms of communicating. This is one of our delivery vans that we use just to get things like mail and other things from one department building to another. And our fleet uh, uh, has allowed us at our expense, but it's not a very high expense, to cover those with safety messages so that uh, we can get that out into our community and we know people are seeing that and it's a relatively affordable way to communicate. Um, uh, get just a little bit touch about micro-targeting and just for those who may or may not know about what micro-targeting is. So micro-targeting is a marketing strategy that uses consumer data and demographics to create smaller subsets or segments for your audience. Um, and just to give you an example, it's like, like typically like the like give, use this ticket or click it as an example of campaign is those are designed in Washington, D.C. for a really broad audience. But that doesn't necessarily translate to, again, a smaller audience within, say, our county that may see that as highly produced outside or um, not necessarily see themselves within, uh, within that. Um, and it allows us to really be much more creative about the kind of things uh, that we do. And uh, it's been really fun. We just uh, launched a campaign last week, which I'm going to show you, but we started with a whole series of ideas of where we're going to go to address distracted driving and cell phone use. We began to look at the desired behavior that we wanted to change, which is what you see in column two, uh, talk about the, whether there's a chance that we can actually impact that change through a campaign, because you know the camp, it, it might be a really important issue, but may not be something that we felt that we could, could address. Um, the size of the population that are currently doing the behavior, uh, the willingness upon that group to make changes. Um, and we chose a campaign that really had all those pieces aligned, that if they didn't have a significant, if it wasn't an opportunity to impact the larger part of the campaign, uh, if the size was too small, we weren't interested in it. And if we thought that the people who were there weren't willing to make that change, then why bother? And so we scored folks on, for a thing, we ended up picking a campaign uh, which was, we thought was relatively straightforward, not a lot of messaging, but essentially is turn on your do not disturb while driving. Uh, you do that in front of me uh, at a classroom, I'm going to give you a prize. You do that at a, at a, at a fair, um, I'm going to give you a prize. Uh, we have an opportunity to talk to parents about modeling early, before your kids are even in driver's education, about making sure that your phone is not do not disturb on driving. And then combining that with a better understanding and focus group with kids on what, what kind of messages will work and what kind of um, uh, opportunities there are to reach people. So uh, we came up with a campaign, which we call Phone Chill, uh, essentially is that your phone needs a break from your continually check in. It's a really exhausting for your phone to always be checking in and you need to focus on driving. So now we're going to attempt this switch and hopefully see uh, a very short video that we've produced that's targeted primarily to TikTok users um, and um, um, Snapchat as well as uh, Twitch. And this campaign, as it's loading, is targeting uh, rural teenagers, particularly in a community called Malala in Gambia. Hey, Rob, I'm going to ask you to mute your phone real quick just during the video, and we'll give this a try. You're about to hear about and that means it's time to use Do Not Disturb to give yourself and your phone a well-deserved break. It's a chance to relax. To get some space to breathe. Trust me, your phone will be fine. And so will you. Use Do Not Disturb and focus on what matters to you. The road. Thank you. Sorry about all the echoing. You may or may not have heard, but just wanted to give you sort of a taste of that is that, you know, we spend time when we cast the, the driver that they were someone that, um, you know, represented community, particularly in some of our areas, 
a, a, a you know teenage girl of color. We wanted to make sure the voiceover was appropriate. We wanted to make sure that the location of filming uh, looked like an area where we were targeting, and all those things uh, came into play. And it actually wasn't really that expensive to do this. And our hope is that if this campaign is successful, then perhaps other communities will take it. Um, we're happy to have people steal our ideas or potentially even steal the actual advertisement itself uh, and bring that to your communities. Uh, other things that we've done is we work with uh, teenagers to design uh, traffic safety messages as part of a campaign that we call our we call posters and coasters. Although uh, we're not doing coasters that much anymore, so it's mostly posters and other things. This year we um, uh, are featuring uh, the artist work on our electric uh, or single cabinets as a way to get throughout the community. And this has been uh, a great project in partnership with State Farm Insurance that pays for a big portion of our expenses on this project. Uh, I, I go into the classroom. I take over our Health One and Health Two classes. Health One are essentially freshmen, high schoolers. Health Two are more your junior and seniors. Uh, there's some overlap in what I cover, but uh, they are they fit the curriculum that uh, that are that they're going through. Teachers really love doing it. So some of that is they have assignments like creating their own posters. But I also have this little driving course where the, I can demonstrate that texting is near impossible uh, while driving. And it's an opportunity to reinforce uh, some of the lessons that we have uh, throughout the year. Uh, in the auditorium, we have a motivational speaker named Kevin Brooks. And one of the things I'll tie back into the conversation that Abe was uh, helping us uh, think through is that one of the things that we learned from this is that well, Kevin, Kevin was in a crash in his 20s. He uh, was paralyzed from his waist down. Uh, his best friend was killed in this crash. At first, we thought that his presentation would all be about traffic safety, and people would be, wow, this is great. I'm not going to drive while drunk. What we learned through process uh, and time to, was that the kids were really attracted to his message about uh, survival and living in really traumatic experience and then going through that and become, still touching base with his individuality and learning to be happier um, and recovery. And so we are now partnering with our Department of Public Health so that this presentation is no longer a presentation on just driving while drunk, but is really about trauma. It's about informed trauma. It's about driving while drunk. Uh, but we can have our, what we call our GO team. Our team can go in advance and work with school counselors so that they are aware that uh, Kevin's going to come in and talk about these issues, and then if things arise, for example, one of the things you're seeing in the bottom picture is this whole group of kids who had a friend who had died uh, in the last previous year uh, because of a car crash, and then we could then come back in with our professional uh, mental health professionals uh, to provide counseling or specialized counseling with the school counselors. So there's a lot of opportunity to kind of think both. It's not just what can public health do for you, but how can public health uh, how can you see yourself as part of the public health uh, work? And then we do events. We do we have what's called Safety Street, which is the uh, picture on the left where we have these little pedal cars, kids ride around who are nine and under, and they come upon traffic uh, signs, and the parents have to say, well, what does this sign mean? And it teach, reinforces pedestrian safety primarily, but other kinds of safety that we hope that as Mill Nager up, again, it's reinforcing uh, those messages, but for the parents, it's reinforcing with the parents. Hey, folks, you need to stop for these signs. Um, and we've uh, uh, the top right is a pledge. Uh, we had people come in and do a dress-up booth, but it was really about talking to parents and getting them to sign a driver's education pledge, driver's pledge to drive safely. And if they said no, their kids were pretty great at providing a lot of peer pressure uh, to do that. And then uh, we have this little wheel where we ask trivia questions. The kids love to get 50 message from person. Can't do it alone. Um, we have a lot of partners that do things like um, uh, child protection seat uh, uh, fittings, and we are amplifying their voice as well as tri uh, ARP and AAA that are doing uh, senior driving education uh, instruction classes, and we will help, again, amplify their voices uh, and then sometimes provide material for them um, and come out and be guest speakers, too. Uh-oh. There we go. Um, 
collaboration requires a commitment uh, to a new way of uh, doing work that you know you can't just um, expect to have your community partners show up if you don't show up for them if you don't provide resources for your partners and one of the things that we're building into our work now for example this uh, campaign that we just launched with uh, phone chill is that our community uh, our communications partner is has twenty five thousand dollars as part of their budget where they can hire community-based organizations to help expand and amplify those messages and provide resources to make sure that those communities uh, that may not be reached uh, through our regular work are being reached. And we're thinking about ways to be much more proactive about engaging communities of color, particularly, and other underserved communities in our planning processes, our um, decision-making processes. Uh, and the more that we can provide dollars, both for capacity building internally on staff as well as dollars potentially to pay for communities involvement in that work uh, the more that collaboration has an opportunity to succeed uh, just some information for you if you're interested in the positive cultural framework uh, they do a training it's a really great training uh, and you can go to the chsculture.org uh, for their for information about their training models and i'm going to cover a little bit about our funding philosophy just so people can, um, we often have questions about this, but fund the staffing uh, directly so that you can prevent losing staff if grants do not come through. We do get grants, we get grants from the State uh, Department of Transportation through Safe Communities Program or 402 funding, but we use that for specialized campaigns, not for my time, because we don't want to have me lose my job because ODOT didn't have money that year. Um, and so make sure that those funding sources you're using don't have strange restrictions and, and don't have the flexibility to be a, uh, creative as well as to, to be um, uh, you know, to, 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 to have the ability to change mid, mid, midstream. Uh, go after grant money for creative new programs that build long-term capacity into your general budget. Uh, and that may take some political work, it may take getting engaged, one of the ways we do that is we have our uh, county government leaders, you know, one of our commissioners is engaged in our external uh, Drive to Zero advisor committee. Uh, and once they're on, it's really hard for them to cut a program loose because they're engaged. Uh, just to give you a quick sense of some of our funding sources, we have general funds that are unassigned funding. We use road fund uh, for our safety related work, but only for road use because of their constitutional restrictions in the state. Our State Department of Transportation uh, is funding our, um, our campaign work through the Safe Communities Program. Uh, we've also accessed all roads transportation safety funding through FHWA and ODOT for things like uh, um, fair warning symbols and other things that we know that are really important, uh, or edge lines. Uh, we recently passed a separate county vehicle registration fee, and a portion of that is going towards safety projects. And we're also not afraid to go after private donors like State Farm Insurance to pay for some of this work as well. And as long as you're good about providing uh, appropriate love back without advertising for them, it's, I think it's a really great partnership to have government and uh, private donors uh, involved. Uh, resources on our end, our website is drivetozero.org. You can see our recent campaign that uh, if you want to see that video on more fuller screen, and uh, you'll see it there. Uh, we also, um, you can tie through there or to this link to our uh, local road action plan or our traffic safety action plan. And uh, for those who are on my side and are interested in learning how do you do this kind of marketing, I recommend joining uh, your local chapter of your social marketing association in North America or SMANA. Uh, it's a great way to network, it's a great way to get new ideas and to help you think outside the box. Uh, lastly, I'll just mention that we are very interested in co-branding campaigns. If you're out there doing a campaign and you think we should learn about it, please let me know. Or if there's a campaign that you like that we're doing and you'd like to tag your uh, logo on it and borrow it, you just give me a call. We would love to do that because we know that this stuff, uh, while it seemingly is expensive, uh, doesn't uh, it, 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 our work can be shared very nicely. Uh, you could be in a place like Jackson Hole, Wyoming, or uh, or the Ozarks, and have a pretty close match to some of our demographics. Um, 
And uh, we also do sharing sessions if you want us to come out and present uh, to your team. Uh, we recently did that for a neighboring county and it was pretty exciting. Um, and helping benchmarking data because a lot of the data we have, uh, if, you're, if you're doing benchmarking, we'd love to hear about it and share that information. And my part is done, and I'll turn it back over uh, to the team for the final poll question. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate that. Um, so I do want to point out again that the YouTube video link, I did put that in the chat pod. And for all of the rest of the links that Rob shared, um, you can find those in that handout that's in the bottom left-hand corner if you want to grab a copy of that. It will also be posted on the Rural Safety Center's website with the archived version of this webinar as well. Um, again, if we do have any questions for any of our speakers, you can put them over in the left-hand side in the chat pod. And we do have one more poll break for all of you. So this question, Um, that was the last question. Is the wrong one. Yes, correct. Uh, so I do not have the right question up here, um, but we will instead just fill out this challenge, uh, challenge. From this particular section of the webinar, what is one action item you'd consider implementing in your jurisdiction? Um, if you want to write that down at your desk and then share it here, um, we'd appreciate that. I am also going to see if I can find the question itself to read that real quick because I believe those are the answers and not the question. So the last question that we have for you is which of the following is not one of Clackamas County's principles for media campaigns and social marketing to support safe system work? And the answers are those ones that are there on the screen. So understand that traffic safety is a public health matter. Establish overall community norms that reinforce safe driving and traffic safety. Focus solely on the responsibility lying with the driver. Clearly anchor the county as caring deeply about traffic safety. Understand the people and the data. Build community collaboration. Direct education focused on where we can make a difference and highly targeted focus campaigns. Again, we're looking for which one of the following is not one of Clackamas County's principles for media campaigns and social marketing to support their safe system work. And we'll give everyone just a, a couple seconds to go ahead and fill that out. And then I am going to broadcast uh, the challenge questions so we can see what's coming in while we're waiting on those. Uh, some of the answers so far is to check and see if there's a um, SMANA uh, chapter in my community, branding on corporate fleets and driver safety classes for seniors and, uh, for seniors and teens. So thank you for, for sharing those. And then I am going to go ahead, um, Rob, and close the poll and broadcast those results for you now, if you wouldn't mind um, talking that through that. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I, all those things are really important, except we do not focus solely on responsibility lying with the driver. Uh, we know that um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. And one of the things that I think we do very well um, because we're a county is we do understand the unique relationships between alcohol, addiction, mental health, and, and care because we're doing it. It's not the Department of Transportation, but it's, you know, there's someone right down the hall from me. And, um, and by participating in those partnerships and coalition building uh, that has nothing to do really in seemingly nothing to do with transportation, but actually has everything to do with road safety, uh, can really focus on this. And I'll give you one, I think, really interesting highlight. We know that the greatest number of people that get into motorcycle crashes in our county are essentially 45 to 65 year old white men, which is also the greatest percentage of people who are committing suicide. Um, so by talking with our coordinator, who coordinates our suicide prevention program, we learn about how they reach those people, how they reach that population, as well as and vice versa. And there are things that we can carry with us. So if I'm already, in, you know, in a presentation where I'm finding, like maybe say it's a Elks Club or a Rotary Club that might have a higher percentage of that population, I can bring material with with me. Uh, to support their work or vice versa. It's just, you know, that's just to be always thinking about what are those potential partners because I, while I, I know I'm a 
employee of the Department of Transportation and Development, I don't see myself solely as an employee of the Department of Transportation and Development. I see myself as an employee of the county. And the county has a much broader level of responsibility. Um, and that's something that has only been reinforced over the past year by me being having the opportunity to be pulled to work on issues like COVID and wildfire. I think that was a, a great example, Rob. Um, I never would have thought of that connection. So thank you for sharing that one in particular. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, like and we, we will show up in and around places. Uh, uh, on the engineering side, Joe is always a big part of Transportation Research Board. Um, if you're going to those, you know, reach out to him uh, when you get a chance. If you're going to DC, I'm likely going to be in Chicago, uh, assuming all, all hands on deck to be in person. Uh, for um, Life Status Conference, uh, feel free to come meet me and ask me questions there as well. Uh, and, and, and you'll probably see Abe and public health uh, features as well. So don't be shy. All three of us are happy to talk. We love to uh, uh, hear new ideas, and we love to be pushed, and we love to share. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to go ahead and get us closed out. We just have a few minutes left, and we don't have any other questions in the chat pod. Um, so we're hoping today that you learn to describe Clackamas County's road safety vision, to define the health and safety in all policies approach used by Clackamas County, and how to identify Clackamas County's media campaign and social marketing um, principles to support safe system work. I do want to mention, um, I said earlier today, that this is a six-part webinar series. Part three will be on safe vehicles and will be held on Wednesday, September 29th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, part four is also scheduled. It will be on safe speeds and will be held Wednesday, October 27th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, part five and six will be held in November and December, and we do not have those dates yet, um, but we'll update our website as uh, registration opens for these. I also do want to um, make sure to mention that there is another webinar series being held by um, the Everyday Counts group, and it is the Safety Summit Series. It's going to be held every Wednesday in September um, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and they will be addressing all of the different um, safety-type projects that have happened in the Everyday Counts from Everyday Counts 1 through 5. So that includes the safe transportation, um, for every pedestrian, the data-driven safety analysis, safety edge, the reducing rural roadway departures, um, high friction surface treatment, intersections, interchange ge geometrics, and also road diets. So again, there are five different September um, webinars that will be happening for that. You can find more information both on the FHWA website and on the Rural Safety Center's um, homepage. Uh, as I mentioned, today's recording will be re will be um, put on our archives page, and that should be up within a few days. You will be receiving the survey shortly following today's webinar if you'd like to request certificate of completion or CEUs. Um, and one more time, I just want to sincerely thank um, our speakers, Joe, Abe, and Rob from Clackamas County. They're doing fantastic things there, and I'm super excited that they were able to come and talk to you guys more about it. Um, at the Rural Safety Center, we've been talking a lot about incorporating the public health approach. And I know that they um, have always been out front in doing this. And so I'm always thankful when they'll come and, and speak and uh, explain to us what's new that they have going on. So their emails are um, up on the screen if you'd like to get in contact with them for more information. Again, they're also available in that PDF on the bottom left-hand side of your screen as well. So with that, I'm going to close out our webinar. Thank you guys all for today. And thank you, Joe, Abe, and Rob. We appreciate you speaking. Thank you.